uh, welcome. Um, thank you for joining this joint American Bird Conservancy, American Birding Association, and Cornell Lab of Ornithology webinar. Um, I'm Mike Parr. I am president of American Bird Conservancy, and I'm based in Washington, D.C., which is where our house is. And so if people have questions about birds uh, that we're seeing, you'll see um, lists of birds to Washington, D.C. That's what we're looking for on our eBird and in our field guides in our backyards. Um, but today we're here to talk about birds, and that's, our, that's the subject. We're all very enthusiastic about bird watching and how much fun it is and what a great um, pastime it is, especially under the current conditions that we're all facing being cooped up, how much fun you can still have with birds in your backyard and stay connected to nature. Um, so we're gonna be tackling a, a few topics. This won't be a very long webinar. We'll probably keep it to just over 30 minutes of presentations. There'll be some time for questions. Um, the main things we're gonna be talking about are how to attract birds to your backyard, um, how to connect with other backyard birders, and also identify some of the birds you see, um, how to get involved in citizen science, and also how to help birds around your own property, whether that be a suburban house, an apartment, or even a ranch, there's things you can do to help birds. Um, given the current challenge we're facing, backyard birding really has taken on a special meaning for many of us, and I know that a lot of people are interested in getting uh, um, going with birding for the first time and a lot of other people have been doing it for a while but are also looking to connect with others. So um, at ABC we've started a bird therapy hashtag um, on social media that you can follow if you're interested in seeing kind of the, some of the sightings and things that we've been talking about. I've been finding birding to be a kind of stress reducer during the day and I find that uh, you know all the Zoom meetings and calls that we're doing um, it's great to take a few minutes and just sort of look and see what's going on in the backyard. And this morning I was on a call and a rose-breasted grosbeak came down to my feeder. Yesterday I had a scarlet tanager. So it's a lot of fun and it just is a stress reducer and helps you sort of get through the day. It helps me get through the day. Our aim this evening is to make sure that both beginners and those who are more experienced will find things of interest in the webinar. Um, and as I said, if we can't get to your question, we'll give you links for further research and also follow up with email. Um, I'd especially like to thank co-presenters Jeff Gordon from ABA and Ken Rosenberg, who is the Applied Conservation Scientist with ABC and Cornell. Uh, and I'd like to thank Jennifer Cipolletti, who's Deputy Director of Policy at ABC, and Jordan Rudder, and some of the folks at ABC have helped set this up, Claire Nielsen, Connor Marshall, and Darius Zabskowski. Um, thank you to, to everybody on the call as participants who's already a member or supporter of ABC, ABA, or Cornell. And if you're not, I would definitely recommend all three organizations. <clears throat> you can find out about them on the, on the web, and I hope you will consider joining. Uh, it's particularly important at this time with spring birds and all the things that are going on to make sure that those organizations are getting support. Um, as you may have heard, uh, we released new data last fall showing a loss of 3 billion birds over 50 years from North America. And we're gonna take some time on today's webinar with Jennifer particularly to let you know what you can do to help turn this decline around on your own property. Um, so I wanna give you, uh, to kick off with the section of, of what you can do to attract birds to your yard, some of my personal top tips. Um, I got started birding in the UK where I was born and um, I know I started with a peanut feeder in my backyard and my favorite bird was great spotted woodpecker that used to come down and green finches and a few other species. And really starting there, it kind of led to a lifetime of enjoyment in birding. Um, so we've kind of turned our small backyard uh, habitat into a um, bird haven. And so here's some of the things that we'd recommend or I'd recommend that you think about if you don't have one or more feeders, there's a variety of feeders I'll show you in a minute. Uh, a bird bath or any bird habitat, um, pesticide free is best. Uh, a bird bath with some moving water is better if you can get a little fountain, a drip, or even there's some uh, solar fountains that you can, solar powered fountains you can put in there. Um, if you haven't really started to um, start to identify the birds in your yard yet, you'll be able to find a number of apps online. Um, both Jeff and Ken will be talking about some of those. 
but there are plenty of field guides that you now can just download on your cell phone. You could do that right now, um, probably around $20, that kind of range, and you'll, you'll be able to get those field guides and start being able to identify some more of the birds you see. I would recommend starting with learning, if you don't know more than 10, start pick 10 common birds that you can really start to learn in your yard, because it's a process of elimination. Once you start to learn 10 common birds, the birds that are less common, you can spend more time on those. And if you really want to take this uh, further, try and buy a good pair of binoculars, because uh, I think you'll get a lot more enjoyment from seeing birds close up. And if you go beyond that, maybe even consider a digital camera, either a point and shoot, there are camera, little cameras you can fix to your feeder, a number of other things you can do that way. So uh, next slide, please. So here are some of the types of feeders that we have up. Um, the top left is what they call a hopper feeder. It's got suet either side of it, can attract different species. You pour the, the seed in from the top and the birds can get access to it. There's a house finch. Um, you can get woodpeckers and nut hatches on those types of feeders. Um, just putting some fruit out can be attractive to orioles or catbirds. Um, at the top right, we have a house wren box. Uh, there are other bird boxes you can put up for a variety of different species, everything from wood ducks to bluebirds. Uh, here in DC, we're mostly focused on house wrens. Bottom left is what we call a tube feeder. Um, and that, as you can see on that, you've got some chickadees and downy woodpeckers. Hummingbird feeders are very popular. We've got three up. We haven't had a hummingbird yet, but we're looking forward to it. And bottom right is a picture of our water feature, which is really just a log that we've got water dripping onto. But birds love moving water and they will come down to that. And if you can put yourself in a position where you can see that, sometimes you can get some good photographs. Birds like warblers might come down and take a drink or some other birds might take a bath. So there are lots of fun things you can do there. Um, Ken will be telling you a little bit more about some web resources that you can go to to get even more information on these things. Um, and we're continuing to feed birds right now. We're still having a lot of fun. We're up to 65 species for the spring in our small DC yard. And I know that wherever you are in the country, either in your yard or just looking at the sky above, you'll be able to see and enjoy some birds during spring migration this year, despite the lockdown we're all uh, under. So um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing the other presenters and to taking your questions. Enjoy birds and uh, I hope you'll be able to do something to help protect them and also to support the organizations that are involved in helping birds uh, that are here today, ABC, ABA, and Cornell. With that, I'll turn it over to Jeff and say thank you again for joining our webinar today. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, this is Jeff Gordon. I'm the president of the American Birding Association. And here are a couple of quick tips um, on the next slide. If, um, you know, one of the things I think is so special about birds is that they really bring the world to our door and invite us to get out and explore, even if our explorations are kind of geographically limited at the moment. I would also say that uh, camera technology is amazing these days. And uh, even what you have in your cell phone uh, can allow you to make a record of what you see or do a little video and get um, sounds you're hearing and to share that with other people. Um, it, it can really help you learn, increase your appreciation. Um, and other birders, um, are really a super resource um, just in terms of, of helping you um, get more skillful, helping you have more fun and enjoyment and understanding what you, uh, what you see and, and just generally doing things better. So um, let's go to the next slide. And I should say, first of all, that I'm talking to you from Media, Pennsylvania, which is just outside of Philadelphia, not too far from the airport. And the background is actually a picture of the woods uh, behind our house. And uh, I took it like two weeks ago. So it's more leafed out than that right now. But anyway, um, and I've spent a lot of my life in the Mid-Atlantic, but birding for me really has been a passport and a kind of magic carpet that's gotten me everywhere from Antarctica, although that penguin on the left is actually an African penguin from Cape, uh, Cape Town, South Africa, uh, to India for tigers, Africa for giraffes, Alaska for tufted puffins. Um, it's really been an amazing um, thing to get involved with. But if we can go to the next slide, 
um, oh yeah, it's also got me on stage with a honest to goodness rock and roll band. Um, this was in Chicago um, earlier this year when we premiered our Bird of the Year, which is Cedar Waxwing this year. Uh, but the next slide um, talks about how birding can give you um, something to be passionate about, um, a cause, um, and um, and really a lot of causes. And um, in the next slide, the uh, the social aspect, um, birding can really help you form a lot of relationships, and um, um, it's definitely been a factor in um, in most of mine uh, over the years. So, um, but all this started, all this globe trotting, everything else uh, on the next slide with a very humble experience in my family's backyard when I was 12 years old and I was looking at the bird feeders and I realized I didn't know nearly as much as I thought I did. Um, I thought that the streaky little birds that hung out with the goldfinches were female goldfinches. And with my field guide, I discerned that those were actually something I'd never heard of, never suspected existed, a bird called a pine siskin. And, um, that is a funny little detail um, to have had such major repercussions in one's life, but that was that was my spark bird, as a lot of birders say, um, that really opened my eyes to a much broader horizon. And I think um, many of you may be having discoveries and epiphanies like that um, of your own close to home now. Okay, on the next slide, um, I've really, you know, signed up for the cradle to grave package pretty much. Uh, birding's been a lifelong thing for me. And I think one of its chief virtues is that it really, truly is lifelong. A, a lot of times, very small children are not so drawn to birds unless they can see them close. And birds around the backyard do offer the opportunity through windows and you know, bring them into feeders and water features and, and backyard plantings and such um, for children to see things very close. And that's very helpful. But, you know, from the time you're like 10, 12, somewhere in there, till you're in your 90s, um, you know, as long as you are lucky to live, uh, birding is something that can really contribute meaningfully to your life and you can contribute to meaningfully. And there's not that many things in this world that are so age agnostic and multi-generational. So on the next slide, um, I'm a big fan of the community of birders and the fellowship of birders. And um, this is a, a kids camp that the ABA does in Colorado. And um, unfortunately, like so many organizations, we're having to postpone uh, all our travel events and everything. Uh, which is really unfortunate, but on the good side, um, it's kind of requiring us to focus closer to home. And on the next slide, you'll see uh, my wife Liz actually looking out our window onto the backyard and, and just enjoying a northern cardinal coming into sunflower seed. And, you know, um, there's a lot of people on this panel who are professionals, um, scientists, conservationists, you know, have traveled the globe and seen amazing things. But um, there's always such a thrill about seeing things right close to home or even in your yard that is, is just unbeatable. Um, on the next slide, you'll see a little bit warmer, more spring-like day uh, when we got to do a little hawk watching from the hammock. And... Uh, you know, if you can't go to Panama or go to Central or South America, on the next slide, you'll see that Panama can come to you in the form of things like broadwing hawks that have spent the winter that far south and are now heading north to breed. On the next slide, um, you'll see a common loon that I took this picture. Both those photos were just about a week ago. And uh, common loons in the winter spend their uh, time on saltwater, but then they go north to breed in the boreal forest and lakes. And um, so it's, it's just a, a couple week little window when here outside of Philadelphia, we might see them just flying over, rocketing north into the spruce forests. So that's really fun um, to have that right from the, right from the deck. So um, next slide. Yeah. Um, birding really brings miracles to your doorstep. And, you know, the more you look, the more you listen, the more you see, the more you hear, the more you know, but also the more questions you have. It's just one of those great things. It's like, uh, 
an incredible Netflix series to binge watch, except they keep making new seasons and the quality doesn't fall off. So it's, it's pretty incredible. And on the next slide, this is, you know, this whole COVID thing and all these restrictions, it's so terrible in so many ways. But one positive aspect is it's happening during the peak of spring migration. And we really do have an opportunity to see birds like the, this black burning warbler on the left. I took it, took the photo last year in West Virginia, but there's actually been a black burning warbler just like this hanging out around our driveway since Saturday. And it was still here this morning. So that's been really a thrill. And then this calliope hummingbird, I took out our uh, bedroom window when we lived in Colorado. And just amazing to have birds like this travel thousands of miles and visit you in your yard. Um, next slide. And, and that, you know, that joy of discovery, that thrill of, you know, this, the beauty of these creatures and just how full of life they are, it really makes you want to share. And, and that is the best way to learn too. And on the left, there's a picture I took of a brewing owl outside Austin, Texas. But the photo I really treasure from that day is this one I took with my cell phone of at the time, 11 year old Sebastian Casares from Hutto, Texas. And he is very proudly displaying his photo that he took of the same brewing owl. And uh, how many things, you know, so many times somebody catches the biggest fish or bags the biggest buck or something like that. Um, how many times can you share something with 50 or 100 other people, um, you know, social distancing and all, but um, birding is very, very shareable. And if it's done well, the birds and the habitat are uninfected. Um, so that's really a wonderful thing. Um, I'm gonna point out one resource that the ABA offers on the next slide, and it's all about interacting with other knowledgeable but very friendly and encouraging birders. It's a Facebook group called What's This Bird? Um, you can find it easily at the uh, Facebook groups slash What's This Bird? And uh, let me call it a no shame zone. You can post anything, um, videos of sounds, uh, crummy pictures, great pictures, um, doesn't matter. It could be common species, it can be rarities, and we will help you. If you want to guess what you think it is, we'll help you figure out where you went right or wrong. And if you just wanna ask, we'll just answer. And um, that's really been a fun community. It's grown to over 40,000 members and um, people find it very educational and entertaining. And it's also discovered some legitimate rarities, um, which is fun too. So um, uh, I think my final slide is this next one. I just wanna, you know, again, say that birding um, will bring, bring the world to you and bring you to the world. And, uh, and along the way, you'll meet some really, really amazing people. So um, I can't recommend it enough. And um, I do hope that interacting with birds uh, right around your own yard is, uh, is bringing some joy to um, a difficult season. So I would like to turn it over to Ken Rosenberg from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and ABC, and he's got some really cool stuff to share with you too. Hey, hey everybody, thank you, Jeff and Mike and everyone for uh, putting on the second edition of this webinar. So for me, birding is all the things that, that Jeff talked about <clears throat> with the added dimension that while I'm birding, I know I'm also collecting data that are useful for science and conservation. So since I work at both ABC and Cornell, I get to be on the front lines of conservation and behind the scenes studying bird populations and how to help them. So having recently published this report showing the loss of three billion birds, I know that the data collected by an army of citizen scientists is crucial both for understanding what's going on today and most importantly for tracking bird populations into the future to see if our conservation efforts are, are successful. So uh, next slide, um, I'll get to all that in a minute, but this is uh, the view out my window in my yard here in Ithaca, New York. 
And like a lot of uh, us in the northeastern U.S., we're kind of trapped in this polar vortex right now, waiting for spring to really happen. But the birds are arriving. And in this really cold weather, a lot of the first arriving birds are hungry and, and are actually uh, coming to the feeders, birds that normally would not come to the feeders. So I've had orioles and catbirds eating suet at my suet feeder and uh, birds like rosebreast and grosbeaks coming to the feeder. So this is actually a, a great time to keep the feeders up for a while because um, especially in the cold weather, a lot of the newly arrived spring birds will, will come to these feeders. And, and every one of these pictures I took yesterday out my front window. So uh, it's a nice little, nice little blind, photo blind. Okay, next slide. So as the world continues to hunker down uh, to fight the COVID pandemic, I think birds can still be a beacon of hope. And like the other organizations represented here, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology offers a variety of resources to help you celebrate the wonder of birds from home. And you can find uh, those resources at this website or at the Cornell Lab's um, homepage. And they range from a menu of citizen science projects that you can participate in throughout the year. So for example, Project Feeder Watch is just ending, but Project Nest Watch is just beginning. And you can, you can find nests and contribute uh, data on those bird nests through the Project uh, Nest Watch um, website or, or project site. Um, all the way to a catalog of learning games and deeper online courses about birds and birding that you could take that are offered by the lab's Bird Academy program. And uh, their newest course, Joy of, of Birding, was just released last week and uh, is really, really popular. Um, next slide. So for those of us who are actually stuck indoors, uh, the lab has a set of live bird cams that are also extremely popular that can be streamed 24-7, giving you an intimate look at owls or ospreys or albatrosses or exotic birds coming to the feeders at the famous Canopy Lodge in, in Panama. We currently have uh, 11 bird cams that are, that are uh, simultaneously running, uh, four at nests, and, uh, seven at nests and four at feeders. A lot of people just sort of keep these running in the background and, and get all excited when an egg hatches or, or a strange bird comes, comes to the feeder. So, so we've got the bird cams. And then also for, for teachers and parents who had to make the a wholesale shift to online and at home learning, the lab's K through 12 education group offers free resources. These were originally developed for classroom teachers, but are now available for everybody. And they include a, uh, a weekly email that's full of science and nature focused ideas and activities for, for cooped up kids. And there's a fresh batch of these that are, that are distributed every week uh, in this email that you can sign up for. Um, next slide. But the, the simplest way, uh, to, I think, to enjoy birds and make a significant contribution to science and conservation is with eBird. And um, I've been birding for over, over 50 years and I've seen a lot of major advances in binoculars and scopes and birding books and apps. And I think eBird is one of those revolutionary advances that's, that's really changing the way uh, people people bird and, and uh, changing the way people interact with birds overall. So eBird is simply an online application and database that allows you to enter a checklist of the birds you see anytime or any place. And not only does eBird keep track of your own sightings and allow you to explore new birding areas, but every checklist you submit contributes to the world's largest biodiversity database and provides data that's critical for bird conservation. So with eBird, we can now visualize the year-round hemispheric migrations of birds like the barn swallow that's shown there migrating each year uh, from the United States and Canada all the way down to Southern South America. There's now data on more than 10,000 bird species in eBird from more than 43 million checklists that have been submitted by over half a million birders year, uh, worldwide. 
And we recently uh, passed a, another milestone with 800 million bird observations in the database. So we're heading, heading for that first uh, 1 billion serve. Um, next slide. Um, so participating at eBird is, is really easy. Um, all you have to do is download the free eBird mobile app to your phone. And the app shows you a checklist of the birds most likely to be found in your area. It helps you plot your location on a map. And you simply submit that checklist of observations into the database with, with one push of the button. <clears throat> Next slide. And along with eBird, you can download the free Merlin app. So Merlin serves as an interactive field guide to the birds in every region of the world now with photos, videos, bird sounds, range maps, um, for every bird generated from the media and data at the lab's Macaulay Library that are contributed by volunteers and from the eBird database. And it's also a powerful bird identification tool using artificial intelligence and facial recognition type computer learning to identify birds from either a simple set of features that you provide or from a photograph. So um, <clears throat> I think Merlin's one of the really coolest things out there. Next slide. So you can also uh, go to eBird.org and explore the entire eBird database. You can explore by species. You can see where any given species is found throughout the year. Look at lots of really cool maps of bird abundance, migration, see what habitats they're using. You can also explore um, by region and uh, places you'd like to go birding for when we're actually allowed to do that again. And this can be um, a whole country, it could be your county, it could be a birding hotspot. And you can generate these uh, bar charts which show every bird species and their frequency of occurrence during, during the entire year. So these are really helpful for keeping track of the birds in a given area or if you're going to be traveling to see what's likely um, <clears throat> to be seen uh, in that area. So okay next slide. So the last thing the last thing I want to mention is that May 9th eBird is going to host Global Big Day and that's only only two days away so the forecast here in Ithaca is for 20 degree wind chills and snow, but it uh, still should, should be an interesting day. So Global Big Day is an annual event to see how many birds can be seen and how many checklists we can collect as a global team, giving this incredible snapshot of where birds are on, on a single day. So last year, there were more than 32,000 uh, eBirders from 174 countries that collected an astounding 92,000 checklists in a, in a single day and they reported nearly 7,000 bird species worldwide. So um, we know that not everybody's going to be able to leave their home to bird this year, but anybody can participate wherever you are. You could enjoy birds from inside your home and still take part in Global Big Day. And we're still hoping to uh, break the record and break the record of 100,000 100, checklists submitted in a, in a single day. So taking part in these simple citizen science projects, collecting data that actually help us track bird populations are one of the seven simple actions that you can take to, at home to, to help birds. And now to uh, go into more detail on some of the other simple actions that you can take to protect birds around your home, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Cipolletti from American Bird Conservancy. Jennifer, you are on mute.
I'm not hearing you currently, Jennifer. Are you, uh, are you live? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Yeah, we, you just appeared, Jennifer, so uh, it could start. Okay, so I'm that's, gonna try. That's good. You're muted again, Jennifer. All right, so I've got to try to do something different. Can you hear me okay now? Very good. Okay, we're gonna give this a go then. So thank you again, Ken, and to all of our presenters for the fantastic information. Um, hello again, thank you for joining us. I'm Jennifer Cipolletti, Director of Conservation Advocacy for American Bird Conservancy. And tonight I will be giving a brief overview of the threats to birds that can be addressed from your home. Next slide, please. So what can you do for birds from your home? We will cover ways you can reduce coll window collisions for birds. We'll talk about keeping cats indoors and not using chemicals in your yard. We'll discuss mitigating all of these threats in and around your home and yard and ways to provide and improve habitat for birds. Next slide. We estimate there are up to about 1 billion collisions a year with glass windows and doors in the United States alone. And collisions are the one experience with wildlife that everyone has had and most of us have had or will have seen multiple. So transparent glass is invisible to both humans and birds, but people can use visual cues to anticipate the presence of glass and avoid collisions most of the time. So if you've ever seen anyone walk into a sliding glass door, you kind of get the picture. Birds, however, don't have this ability and they perceive reflected images as literal objects, which explain why glass reflections, especially ones that present images of food or shelter or an escape route can trigger collisions. The good news, however, is that there are solutions to this problem and they're simple and easy. Solutions are pretty much based on covering up glass in some way. Uh, you can add a pattern and it should always be on the outside of the glass rather than on the inside if possible. And one way to do this is to put up exterior screens. So you can see the photo on the right. It shows the window where the left side has an insect screen and it has almost no reflection. And the window on the right does not have a screen and is highly reflective. The great thing is that screens are cheap and easy. So the photo on the left shows tempera paint, which is non-toxic and could be good for a kid's project. And they can help paint windows while at home right now. Next slide. We've got some more solutions on this page. We have an example of ABC's bird tape on the left. You put it up following spacing rules of two inches by two inches. The middle shows a really great product called Feather Friendly with white window decals of white dots that are two inches apart. And on the right is the Zen Window Curtain or otherwise known as a Copian Bird Savers. And they actually have a really great how to make your own on their website, which could be a fun project while everyone is stuck at home. So ABC has all these solutions and more on how to make your windows and buildings bird friendly. So you can check that out on our website later. And we recommend you take action. We're not asking or expecting anybody to do this for every window on your home or office. But if you've ever heard a collision on your window, you just treat that window. And if you have windows or doors that are reflective, you can treat those too. And once you do that, you wait until you hear or you see another collision and then you do that window. And then before you know it, you'll have done many of the problem areas on your windows. And the primary reason that birds hit a window is that it sees the reflection of skies or trees in your window or the window is transparent and the bird thinks it can fly through habitat on the other side. As these examples show, you can significantly reduce collisions with windows and doors by using simple and easy solutions. Next slide, please. So many of us here at American Bird Conservancy have cats and we want to make sure that they are safe and they're healthy and we want to protect birds too. We know that cats kill up to 2.4 billion birds each year. Outdoor cats do have shorter lives than indoor cats due to numerous threats they face themselves like predation, humans being hit by cars, and cats also transmit diseases to people and other cats. 
So what is the best way to protect birds while keeping cats and people healthy? Well, keep the cats inside or outside under control. You can walk cats on a leash. You can use catios or fence toppers. Don't feed outdoor cats. Feeding outdoor cats contributes to a larger population and they are not a part of the natural ecosystem. We want to keep birds, cats, and people safe. So we're just asking that everyone treat cats like we do treat dogs, which is responsibly. Next slide, please. So in the United States, there are about 40 million acres of manicured lawns, which is about the size of the state of Wisconsin to put it into perspective. A huge percentage of these lawns are sprayed and fertilized and treated with weed killers, but you don't actually need to spray for anything. So make sure when you buy seeds of any kind that they are not coated. Seeds are often coated and covered in chemicals and they can decimate a bird population. And you can often tell that they are, because they're artificially brightly colored, like this photo that we have here, and they just don't look natural. Next slide, please. So goals for your yard are always going to be native plants. You want the right kind of plants and physical structure for birds to use in a number of ways. All plants should be native whenever possible. They're the best choice for birds because birds evolved with these plants, not non-native species. So the same is also true of insects. Native plants support healthy insect populations for birds that rely on them for food. Audubon Plants for Birds has a really nice website where you can enter your zip code and enter plants or birds that you are trying to attract to your yard. Local land trust or nature center will also be helpful. So Wild Ones is a good resource too for finding guidance on what kind of plants you can be using. Plants are not just important for food, but also for cover. So evergreens are important where there are harsh winters. I know Ken was talking about a polar vortex coming. Um, birds use these for roosting and protection from predators. Leaving brush and shrubs in your yard in place. Good, they're good, really great protection from the elements and from predators. So structures, you're going to want multiple levels, different heights of plants, short shrubs, taller layers, trees. It just really allows for more diverse habitat for birds. And if you think about us as humans, we like different things as well. So it's kind of the same for the birds. And you'll want to minimize grass as much as possible. Most birds won't utilize grass. You might see a robin pulling a worm out of the grass, but that's about it. And water features. I saw people mentioning in the chat earlier that they're great for birds. It's absolutely true. You just want to make sure that the water is flowing so you don't attract mosquitoes. And habitat for insects is critical as a food source for birds. Even birds that show up at your feeder, and again, we were a lot of talking about feeders on the chat, but these birds, even though they eat seeds, they still feed their young mostly insects, not seeds. So leaving the yards, the leaves in your yard is a really great way to help this. It's less work for you, keeps moisture in the ground, and it allows insects to survive the winter. And when birds return in the spring, there will be food. Another great way is don't cut down your flowers, even if they grow tall. Leave the stems for the birds to utilize in the winter. It adds character to your yard and it's a great place for birds. And if you see this picture in the bottom right corner, it's a bug hotel. So it's a really fun thing that kids can do while everybody's staying at home right now. It provides a great place for bugs to hide and to survive. And it all comes down to not spraying your yard with chemicals. And overall, you don't want to devastate the ecosystem in your yard, and you want to provide a natural environment for birds to flourish and enjoy. And all of these are really great ways that people can do them around the country. I'm in Washington, D.C. right, right now, same place that, that Mike Parr is, and everybody has different things they can do. Um, so thank you again so much for having us tonight, and I will turn it over to Jordan Rudder, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, hi. Um, so we have had a very active chat, which is awesome. And I also am behind the email address uh, associated with the webinar. So I've been getting a lot of emails uh, to go through as well. Um, if we could put up the next slide, since unfortunately we won't be able to get through all of them, please make sure that you check out the ABC website, which is abcbirds.org. Um, we're also on social media. And again, you can gladly email us and we'll be sure to follow up. But to start off, um, we're going to go to Ken Rosenberg. Um, Ken, if you could tell us a little bit more about brown-headed cowbirds and how the interaction of them with other birds 
um, is something that that is natural, is something that we shouldn't necessarily um, always be upset about, um, and why brown-headed cowbirds are both protected and declining or managed in some places. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. So, um, so unlike house sparrows and starlings and, and some other birds that, that, that people don't like very much, uh, brown-headed cowbirds are a native species and they actually have a really cool biology if you get to know them. And that's one of the reasons people don't like them because cowbirds lay their eggs in other birds' nests. They're uh, what are called brood parasites. And in some places, for some bird species, um, this could actually be a problem for them. And, and especially birds that um, are forest birds and did not evolve with brown-headed cowbirds in their habitats, they often don't have defenses against cowbirds. Some other birds like yellow warblers um, actually will build a layer of nest right over the cowbird eggs and the cowbirds will lay more eggs and they'll build. So you could have these like apartment building structures of yellow warbler nests as a defense against cowbirds, but many birds don't have that. So if you've got like an, an endangered species that's trying to recover, such as the, with the Kirtland's warbler example, the scientists discovered that cowbirds were actually a pretty big problem and one of the reasons why Kirtland's warbler populations were, were not increasing. So those cowbirds had to be managed locally. But um, across the entire continent, cowbirds are, are a native species, they're a migratory bird, they've actually just recently arrived uh, back here in New York, and uh, they're, they're really kind of beautiful to look at as well. So I guess my, my answer would be just to um, accept the cowbird and its habits as, as part of the natural system, and cowbirds are actually a declining species along with many other common birds right now as well. Jordan, could I add a comment on cowbirds? Absolutely, if I can just oh, yeah. say, it, just before you start, Good. Um, mm -hmm. Folks are raising their hand, and I'm not sure if that's in response to the cowbird question or they have other questions, but please use the chat box and we'll try to address it. Over to you, Mike. Yeah, we have cowbirds in our yard, and uh, one of the fun things that I like to watch with cowbirds is that the males have a display in which they kind of sort of puff themselves up and they lean forward and then they pick up their wings and then they utter their calls. And if you look out for that display of the, the male cowbirds, it, I've been trying to capture the perfect photograph of them doing that. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I've got a nice one of the male puffing himself up. So they can be fun to watch. Um, <clears throat> and I know that there is concern about them, but uh, some of the changes we've made to the landscape have allowed cowbirds to spread into other areas. But we've made so many changes to the landscape that it tends to be us making those changes that's driving the declines, not so much the cowbirds. They might play a role, as Ken said, in certain areas. but. Overall, we need to look at the changes we're making and, and tackle those as our number one priority for conservation. Absolutely. Uh, moving on, I have a question that I'm going to ask Jeff to answer. Um, it's related because a lot of folks have asked about how to attract certain species of birds to their yard, what feeders, what food to put out, but also what birds not to attract or how to get rid of certain species of birds that they don't want in their yard. So. Would you mind addressing uh, that in, in a larger picture? Sure, sure. And um, yeah, this is, uh, you know, backyard birding is a great opportunity to learn wildlife management 101 <laughs> um, because inevitably there are some, uh, you know, some species that people favor and some they don't. And it's very much in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, some people will pay hundreds of dollars for an anti-squirrel feeder that will, you know, sense their weight and fling them off the feeder kind of thing. Other people get those little corn cob holder things, especially to delight in their antics. So, um, you know, there's a lot of aesthetics that enter into it. But um, one thing that I would definitely recommend is don't buy cheap supermarket bird seed. Um, a really good inexpensive bird seed is the black oil seed sunflower. That is very attractive to a wide spectrum of birds that almost everybody likes and it's much less expensive than some of the bigger striped sunflower seeds. So that's a winner in my book. Um, I'm also pretty partial to suet. Suet tends to bring in 
some nice woodpeckers and nut hatches and even cat birds and things like that will visit it. Um, um, things like cracked corn and millet can be a mixed bag in some yards. Um, they're really popular with some really nice birds. Um, in some situations, especially very open, like suburban lawns, um, they can bring in a lot of blackbirds. And oftentimes people don't like that, especially because they feel like they're consuming a lot of seed. Um, I would also say that water and shelter are good things to offer. Um, and, and that's another reason to plant native plants. You know, you tend to get stuff everybody likes. Um, but I, I think maybe, you know, and, and we could do a, an entire webinar on sending out the right invitations and keeping out the uninvited guests. But um, I guess I would just say experiment, um, talk to other people. There's a lot of good resources out there. And realize that if you decide to really try to cut down on your house sparrows or something, it's a process. It's, it's hard to achieve total victory. <laughs> on any species. Thank you. Uh, the next question I'm gonna ask Jen to answer. Um, so some, we're having some questions about cats. Uh, could you please share why ABC supports our cat solutions um, as, as our stance? I'm gonna test my audio first. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, technical difficulties abound when working from home. So, okay, Jordan. So the question is, what do we support for yep. cats? Basically, could you just re restate both ABC's stance on cats and what we're proposing folks do to help with the issue? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So we know that, you know, it was mentioned in our presentation that 2.4 billion birds are killed each year from cats. And we know that cats are not a part of the natural ecosystem. So our absolute number one stance is keep your cats indoors. There's no reason that cats need to be outside. Um, I know that it's really hard to talk to people. I know I have members of my own family and friends that think that cats should be outside and they can't keep them indoors, but I actually, my parents and my niece Brooklyn, they built a catio in their yard. And so their cats can go outside where they're completely safely contained. It's a really, really great thing to do. You can walk your cat on a leash like we talked about. And what we don't want to do is we don't want the cats to get hurt and we don't want them to get diseases or to get run over or to get attacked by coyotes or raccoons. So we want to keep them inside at all times if possible and just keep them outside to be completely restricted. Um, and we know that TNR may reduce cat populations, but it doesn't reduce the number of bird deaths, and which is what we're really trying to mitigate. Thank you, Jen. Um, Next um, Jordan, oh. sorry, could I yeah. just add a note on TNR? Because I see a couple of, of chats coming up on that. Um, you know, ABC has been working on our Cats Indoors campaign for over 20 years, and we've been tracking TNR very closely. Um, our experience, and we've studied it uh, a fair bit, is that it really doesn't work um, to reduce cat populations. And I suppose it might be possible to have the perfectly managed TNR program in which every cat is trapped and there are no incoming cats from outside and every cat is, is spayed or neutered. But that's not really the practice that happens, even though it sounds great. Um, most of the time, the, the spay and neuter is not kept up with. A lot of, a lot of times, uh, people are dropping cats off because it's a good place. They know of the, the colonies, they abandon more cats. The, the average experience is that those colonies do not really reduce over time. And in the meantime, as Jennifer pointed out, birds are being killed. So we don't support that as a solution for the feral cat problem uh, because just the science and the data that we've got doesn't support its effectiveness. Mike, would you mind sharing for everyone what TNR means exactly, both not just the acronym, but what it means? Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's trap neuter release. It means that volunteers will come out, trap cats, neuter them, and re-release them back to where they, they trap them. Um, but as I said, it tends not to be um, delivered at, as, as a very um, systematic, thorough program. It, 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 it tends to end up with more cats getting dropped off and the, the population is not being reduced. Thank you. The next question, I'm going to go back to Ken. Uh, Ken, there have been some folks that are following up on the brown-headed cowbird question, specifically focusing on HOSP, 
which is the banding code for house sparrows. So would you mind talking about why folks should care about house sparrows and their decline since they're non-native? Sure, so um, <clears throat> that was actually one of the most surprising results that we got in this big continent-wide population study that was published last fall, is we saw that not only are rare and threatened bird species declining, but a lot of really common and familiar bird species are losing their abundance. And among those were house sparrows and European starlings and rock pigeons were among the, the steepest declining bird species on the continent. And, and so there was this immediate reaction, well, isn't that a good thing that we're losing house sparrows? And um, it might be in a very narrow sense, if you're thinking about house sparrows as a non-native species that are potentially competing with native birds, um, we're not trying to encourage the populations of house sparrows. But as part of these broader results, what that told us is that whatever house sparrow, whatever many, many common birds are experiencing, house sparrows and starlings are experiencing the same thing. And that if, and that if we can't keep the environment healthy for common birds, if we can't even keep house sparrow populations healthy. So that, it, to us, it really reinforced the idea of birds as canaries in the coal mine and as this being a signal that something very broadly, um, a, big, a broader problem was happening in the environment. And it's also very interesting. I mean, Mike was a co-author on this paper and another co-author was a, a European scientist. And they pointed out that, well, house sparrows and starlings are actually declining within their native range right now. And, um, and they're declining worldwide, wherever they're being studied. So, I mean, it's sort of far-fetched, but there may come a point when these birds are, are, are threatened within their native range. And it might even be that North American populations of house sparrows or starlings um, could have some conservation value. And I'm not saying that's true right now, but um, I, I would just say to, to acknowledge that, what, that the declines in house sparrows are, are it's a bigger uh, signal than what's just going on with the house sparrow itself. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to go to Jeff next, if that's okay. Um, Jeff, some folks have asked about um, restrictions to backyard birding, um, whether that's that they can't put up feeders because of safety issues such as bears, um, hygiene issues because of unwanted rodents, or even just living on top on the top floor of an apartment. Mm -hmm. So what would you say in terms of both birding at this time as well as the birding community? Okay. Um, yeah. And, and this is one thing that just this whole COVID thing has, you know, brought into relief. I think um, a lot of us were aware of it, but it's even, you know, more prominent now is not everybody has a backyard, not everybody has equal access to, you know, green spaces and, and birds. And, and there's a lot of, of problems there, but sort of focusing more uh, specifically on what you're talking about, I would say, you know, most most yards you can sort of maximize. Um, and it might be if you're, you know, up in a skyscraper in a city, you know, literally getting on the roof and watching what flies over may be your best ploy. Um, one thing that I do recommend in a lot of cases where other types of feeding is impossible is water. Um, even like a little dish of water can be good. You can actually get a little spidery looking thing with a battery in it that will um, make the surface of the water move and that is often very attractive to birds. Another thing if you want to get really fancy even in a little um, you know apartment setting or something like that there's actually little misters you can get uh, like a hose that'll just spray a fine mist of water and actually birds have to keep their feathers clean and bathing is a time of high anxiety for them because if they have to go down to a stream or a puddle they might get eaten by a frog or a fish or gosh knows what and if they can find a water source up they love it they just it's like ah private shower i don't have to worry about anything uh, or worry about as much so um that can all be really good another thing i would point out if you have um there are like sort of no waste or low waste seed mixes 
that you can get from some of the wild bird specialty stores that can help. Um, but yeah, um, sometimes there are just situations where feeding just isn't possible. So, um, you know, I would, it's a challenge making the most of what we have, but everybody's dealt a little different hand. I will say too, um, just cause I know you're an mm -hmm. advocate of this, Jeff, uh, mm -hmm. but you can bird anywhere. So even if you can't attract birds, just make sure to look outside your window and make sure that, you know, eyes to the sky, there are going to be birds flying over, which you can't say about tigers or salamanders or sharks. Um, you know, birds are everywhere. So that's, definitely, that's definitely a great thing about right now. Um, Jordan, I'd like to add a, a comment on that. Um, absolutely. I hear people say to me, you know, are you going to go birding? And I say, I'm actually, I never stop birding. Because you can just about, except when you're completely inside the house, um, you can just about bird all the time. And even when I'm inside my house, I can hear some birds singing outside, but driving along, it's just a great thing that you can do as a sort of little side project throughout your life, is to just keep a, a little list of what you're seeing. And I, I find a lot of fun from that. So I, I, I basically am always birding at some level. It's not an act. I start and stop. I wouldn't expect anything less from you. Um, I am going to direct my next question to Jen, if that's okay. Um, the question basically is summed up by saying, do we need to pay for really expensive retrofits or other solutions to help with collisions, um, especially for folks that don't own their home, uh, so mostly apartment buildings? Can they do things to their windows to help, help birds? That is an excellent question. You, you don't, don't have to spend. You're, you're, you're a little jar, uh, garbled. Sorry about that. I think we may have uh, some participants who are unmuted. Can you hear me better right now? No, unfortunately. Maybe. Um, yeah, I can hear the garbling too. How about um, I'll come back to you, Jen. So, Mike, I'm going to come to you now um, and follow up. Uh, there have been several questions about bird conservation and organizations and partners uh, during this time of COVID-19. Would you mind addressing that topic? Sure. Well, I can, I can certainly address it from the point of view of ABC. Um, you know, there's actually a lot that we can still do. And I was just talking to Steve Holmer, who's our head of advocacy. He's been on the Zoom with some of the congressional representatives today. There's still work going on on Capitol Hill on other things than COVID. And during this time, there have also been some weakenings of some environmental regulations. One, one that we're particularly concerned about is the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And so if people want to support groups that are working to make sure that the Migratory Bird Treaty Act remains intact, you can certainly go to the ABC website and you'll be able to find information there about how you can lend your voice to that. Um, as far as ABC's other program work, our habitat work, you know, a lot of our staff are working in more remote areas. Um, for example, we've got, um, you know, for folks working on forestry, where they're doing forest management plans and things like that, where they can work independently, um, so they don't have to worry about social distancing as much. Uh, we've got folks working on the beaches in Texas, uh, trying to protect some of the colonies of birds uh, against disturbance. But a lot of that work was, they were able to do whilst beaches were quiet, and they can get there early in the morning and get some of the signs out. Uh, so again, they don't have to do too much, but there's no doubt that there'll be delays on some of our projects. And of course, uh, we're concerned about the financial implications of that. We're trying to work to get funding in place because uh, staff need to be paid and projects can be delayed. But overall, it's a mixed bag and some folks are able to work and make some progress and others are, are more held up. Um, but we're doing the best we can and we're trying to power through it and uh, hoping that we'll, we'll all come out with birds doing better. But of course, some of the lack of disturbance that's been going on can be good for birds in the meantime. So hopefully the, the net result will be, um, <clears throat> despite the, the difficult conditions everybody's facing, at least we'll, we'll get through this and focus on uh, better times. But birds still remain, as Kenneth said, kind of a beacon of hope and consistency. And bird therapy is, uh, is my go-to place if I'm uh, run ragged by too many Zoom meetings. 
Thanks, Mike. Given time, I'm just going to share on Jennifer's behalf, she messaged that to find out more information about bird collisions and different solutions that you can do at your home that are cheap, um, please check out birdsmartglass.org. And unfortunately, we didn't get through all of the questions, but as you see on the screen, there are various ways to get in touch and we will definitely follow up um, to help you get those bird answers that you're looking for. Mike, any last words? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone for participating. We will follow up by email. We'll try and answer any other questions you want to send us. And I re remain uh, to thank Ken Rosenberg of ABC and Cornell Lab, Jeff Gordon of ABA, Jennifer Cipolletti of ABC, and Jordan of ABC, plus all the ABC folks who didn't present but helped to make this possible. Uh, so thank you all very, very much. And uh, we may indeed do yet another version of this webinar at a later date. Um, but hope you enjoyed it and check in with the groups uh, following this. We'll try and answer your questions and hopefully you'll be able to lend your support to bird conservation through ABC, ABA and Cornell as well. So thank you and enjoy birding. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.